much for coming out to uh, Marijuana's True Impact on Colorado, a symposium at Colorado Christian University. Uh, you know, initially we were thinking up of names. We thought, hey, let's call this Weed Fest 2017, but <laughs> not so much. Probably wouldn't work too well here at CCU. Well, uh, good morning. My name is Jeff Hunt. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy at Colorado Christian University. I'm the director of our think tank, the Centennial Institute. And we're so grateful that you joined us for a day-long conversation on the true impact of marijuana here in Colorado. Now at CCU, we always start our events with a prayer and a pledge. Um, so if you don't mind, please stand and join us for prayer. We're going to be uh, leading us in prayer is Courtney Rainier, and leading us in the pledge is Ben Lindstrom. Good morning, everybody. I'm actually going to read you guys a prayer, just so I think it fits this event. Very formal, very precise. Um, so if you can bow your heads in prayer with me. Dear Lord, today as we come to you, we want to humbly thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us. We want to thank you for providing students, faculty members of Colorado Christian University with this amazing opportunity to invite our local community into our home as we advocate for you and your truth. Lord, we are filled with such gratitude for the ability to respectfully evaluate, discuss, and even disagree on current issues in our world on such a loving yet logical public platform. We want to thank you for the capacity to think inquisitively and communicate in such a variety of ways while respecting all perspectives, even as they may contradict our own. Our hope for today is that we will be able to open a collective dialogue about our culture today for our community once, while inspiring all people from all different walks of life to open their minds and their hearts to what we will be hearing today from our speakers throughout this morning and this afternoon. We pray that our speakers today speak from a place of logic, understanding, productivity, kindness, and truth. And ultimately, Lord, we want to pray to you that you lead us in truth, for we understand that you are and always will be the way, the truth, and the light. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you all join me for the pledge? I pledge allegiance. Aren't our students here at CCU great? That was a wonderful prayer. Thank you very much. Well, with the symposium today, I hope you will connect with a variety of different speakers. We have experts in healthcare, education, law enforcement, business, public policy, and more. And I have three goals for today. Number one, that we have a better understanding of the true impact of marijuana commercialization in Colorado. We really want to dive in deep to the truth of what's happening here. Secondly, I hope that you will connect with fellow like-minded people who share our concerns about the safety and well-being of Colorado. I hope that we can work together, develop friendships, and move forward from this, uh, from this symposium. And finally, thirdly, I hope that we can develop public policy that will reduce the impact of illicit drugs in Colorado. I think no matter where you are on marijuana, bottom line, we want a better Colorado. And so the question is, how can we work together to enact better public policy? Well, we're going to get right to it and introduce one of our first keynote speakers. Uh, we are so proud to have the president and CEO of Smart Approaches to Marijuana, Dr. Kevin Sabet, with us this morning. Described by NBC as the prodigy of drug politics and policy, Dr. Sabet is an author, consultant, former advisor to three U.S. presidents, presidential administrations, assistant professor, and serves as the president and CEO of Smart Approaches to Marijuana, which he founded with former Congressman Patrick Kennedy in 2013. He has studied, researched, written about, and implemented drug policy for almost 20 years. He has worked in the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, and in 2011, he stepped down after serving more than two years as a senior advisor to President Obama's drug control director having been the only drug policy staffer to have ever served as a political appointee in a Democrat and Republican administration. He has served since at the Aspen Ideas and New York Festivals, or he has spoken, appeared since, at the Aspen Ideas and New York Festivals on the Organization of American States Blue Ribbon Commission advising hemispheric drug policy and in hundreds of forums and discussions promoting the ideas outlined in his first book, Reefer Sanity, Seven Great Myths About Marijuana, published by Buford. 
He has been featured on the front page of the New York Times and in virtually every major media publication and news channel on the subject of drug policy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Kevin Sabet. Thank you, Jeff. That's a very, very kind introduction. It was exactly the way we practiced it outside, so thank you. Uh, no, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to be with you and uh, to laugh a little at a very sobering subject, I think. Uh, and so many of you I've had the privilege of learning from and working with as you're struggling here in ground zero, which is what it is. It's ground zero for uh, this public health and public safety disaster that is not about the legalization of marijuana, actually but about the commercialization, promotion, advertising, normalization of intoxication, starting with marijuana. And it's amazing here at Colorado Christian University to be here and, and the leadership that Jeff and, and his staff have provided, not only with this conference, but with all the work that you've done prior to this and um, the great other great people that you have in this state, um, you know, the different groups that are, uh, have been involved and, and certainly uh, have put in a lot of time on this issue. Uh, interesting to be here at, a, at, Christian, at Colorado Christian because in many ways I feel like marijuana has become a religion, uh, a love affair. Uh, for so many people. And um, it's a love affair, I think, whose uh, profit, I would say false profit, is greed and uh, money. And that this is much more about a small number of people getting very rich than it is about um, some lofty goals. We, you know, reducing incarceration or uh, making sure that we have criminal justice reform and social justice, which we all want. Uh, but it has absolutely turned into something that is really all about the money. You know, if you can imagine, it's interesting also to be in Colorado, which has now, I believe, the second highest rate of opiate overdose in the country. And people say, well, can't marijuana be a substitute? Um, what, what's amazing about the opiate epidemic is, uh, folks, we know how this story ends with commercial intoxication. I mean, we have the example uh, with our opiates. We have, we have a, a, the example of companies that um, started uh, promoting something as medicine and uh, got rich off of that intoxication. And we're all bemoaning the fact that we have this opiate epidemic and what can we do? And yet, at the same time, it seems like we're opening our you know, uh, arms out and our doors, rolling out the red carpet for yet another industry, very, very similar to the opiate. Uh, epidemic. And what's amazing is, you know, I meet so many people who have confused the potential medical potential, you know, uh, a promise that may be in the marijuana plant. And there may be kids with seizures that benefit from certain oils that don't get you high and certain uh, formulations of that. But what the industry has so brilliantly done is confused all of these issues together. And they say we need to legalize and commercialize marijuana because this kid has a lot of, has seizures, um, or we th they also confuse criminalization that we need to legalize in order for you know young especially men communities of color not to be imprisoned and commercialized. Mixing up all of these issues and confusing the American people. Um, if you just think about it for a minute, can you imagine if a Purdue Pharma, which produces OxyContin, imagine if Purdue Pharma said one day they, have a bl that they came out with a blockbuster drug that they were announcing to the press, but they said, you know, we're not gonna go through the FDA to see if it passes scientific muster. We're not gonna allow this drug to be in, uh, uh, dispensed at pharmacies. Instead, what we're gonna do is run a political campaign for a few years and see if the people agree that this drug should be made legal. If they did that, we'd put those CEOs in prison. There, there wouldn't be any discussion. Um, but exactly 10, 15 years ago here, we did that with something called medical marijuana. And, and no doubt about it, it was about softening our attitudes towards a drug that, uh, uh, that, that, that didn't have a great reputation, I think, for good reason. And now, of course, we've moved on, we've moved on from that. Um, you know, it's, it's great to see young people here. Um, and what's amazing about it is, is this is really all about them. It's really all about your future in so many ways. And what's also incredible is that I would guarantee that no one under 20 in this room knows who the Marlboro Man is or Joe Camel. <laughs> which is in a, uh, see, they're not making any, because they don't know what I'm talking about. And that's, I'm so happy you don't know what I'm talking about. That, that warms our hearts, trust me. It's a good thing. It's a very good thing. But think about that for a minute. 
we all knew about, we all know who those uh, mascots are. We all remember smoking sections in restaurants. Um, I had a 20 year old come up to me the other day who said he didn't believe me when I said that at one point we thought in society it made sense to uh, allow uh, smoking at 40,000 feet in the air in a small metal tube that already doesn't have a lot of oxygen. That was considered okay at one point. And um, how much progress we've made, but that progress, folks, if you think about it, is no laughing matter. It was done at the expense of millions of lives lost. 80 years or 100 years of lies and deceit from an industry, this time it was the tobacco industry, that said that they had a product, first they said it was medical, which they did. They even said it would cure asthma, if you can believe that. <laughs> we have the ads, it's, it's, real. it's real. I didn't believe that when I heard it, but it's real. Then they said it's only for adults. Then they said the candies and chewing gums and things that appealed to young people really are not about young people. They're really meant for adults. Then they said we should allow it in public spaces. And then they talked about the rights of smokers. And we took that hook, line, and sinker. And then finally, sort of, you know, recently, we've woken up to the fact that they were lying to us for almost a century. You know, uh, tobacco wasn't that deadly before the invention of the modern cigarette. And we've had tobacco used for a long time in society. The incidence of lung cancer and things going on with it came because of the marketing and promotion and new products developed by an industry that wants to get rich. And so today, when I talk to a lot of parents who think marijuana is no big deal, you know, they say, well, at least my kid's not using heroin or, or drinking, they might say. Um, the marijuana that, of course, they're familiar with is not resembling at all the THC products, the waxes that are 99% pure, is the claim, which is an incredible claim, given that I guarantee you all the research today about the harms of marijuana is being done on marijuana less than 10% THC. It's looking at longitudinal studies over time when no one could imagine you could have above 30%, let alone 99% pure wax. The parents don't understand what, um, what, the, what the edibles and these other things are, because edibles in their time were some brownies that their dorm mate made and it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't the you know ice creams, cookies that are appealing to young, to young people. And so I think there's just a radical disconnect right now between where the science is and where most people are on this issue. And I, for one, can tell you, I don't think it's too late to be pushing back. Folks, we're in year, f next month will be year five, fifth anniversary of Amendment 64 passing. It took our country, sadly, 90 years to wake up from our nightmare of tobacco. I hope it doesn't take 90 years. I hope we don't have to have our hand burn on the stove to realize the stove is on. It might, but I am fully confident that with your help and the help of there's so many great people and groups in here, you know, Smart Colorado's done such incredible work uh, in pushing back. People like Joe McGuire and our SAM affiliate working with workplaces and others to get the word out. Um, seeing people like Justin Luke Riley, the head of Young People in Recovery, who's actually now taking a, a larger role uh, with his blog, The Green Brick, and then moving on from that. Um, I am confident, and obviously the leadership at CCU, and so many other people, Dr. Ken Finn here, so many, so many folks, parents, Aubrey, others that are here, I am convinced that this thing can be turned around. I know it's hard because you're living in an environment where, I mean, it takes me four rental cars when I come to Denver International to get one that doesn't smell like marijuana. Um, and so I get the culture here. Uh, when I bring this up to people, which I try to talk about this, you know, they, for them it's, you know, well, it hasn't, I don't know, it doesn't really affect me or it's fine. I guess it's regulated and we're getting some tax dollars. I get that it, you can easily feel d disturbed by what's happening, but I am confident that this is something that um, history, as, as Patrick Kennedy has told me, whose dad fought big tobacco for so long, history will not look kindly upon the folks who let this happen. And none of you can be blamed for the modern t tobacco epidemic. You know, you weren't around 100 years ago when we could have stopped this. You certainly weren't around 5,000 years ago when alcohol became normalized. And our two legal drugs are the two biggest killers of all. Tobacco and alcohol kill six, uh, sorry, 11 times as many people in this country yearly than opiates right now. And we're saying we're in an opiate epidemic, which we are because it's, it's a huge problem, the, the biggest of opiates we've ever had. But when you compare that relative to what our legal drugs do, and when you compare the heroin and fentanyls to what our legal drug, the impact of our legal drugs, um, 
when you have the apparatus of commercialization behind you, that's a very deadly combination. And uh, I think that we can learn from the past and hopefully not repeat a lot of these mistakes. Um, let's see, uh, maybe we can just switch the PowerPoint, uh, although I'd l I'm very, I'm fascinated. I can't wait to hear my old colleague, former colleague, Dr. Murray at the White House uh, talk, but maybe if we just switch some of the, those, those slides up to my presentation, I'm happy to talk. But what's amazing about, so sure, can I do mine? I, I, don't, I can't give it like you can. Oh, I, I learned from the best here. So, <laughs> well, uh, maybe if actually if I just go forward all the way, well, it'll get me there. That's what he was going to do. Great. There, okay, there we go. Let me just do that. Um, what's amazing is that, if you just, you could start from that first slide here. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, that's good. Florida, great. Um, what's amazing is that in this, in the last 10 years, we've seen actually a big reduction in drugs among young people. Actually, what's, you know, young people today are not using drugs the way that, you know, when I, I hate to age many of you, but a lot of the generation in here might have used. I mean, in the 1970s, we were using way more drugs than we are now. On, a, on in terms of on a regular uh, basis, and many of you remember those 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 days. Um, but in terms of marijuana, alcohol, tobacco, the numbers don't are actually much higher back then. Um, in fact, we're in an opiate epidemic. But in the last ten years, among high school seniors, all drugs except for marijuana have gone down twenty three percent. Folks, the opiate epidemic, let's be very clear, because you might be thinking, why are we talking about marijuana when Colorado's the second largest state, highest state in the country for uh, opiate deaths and, and opiate uh, abuse? Because, folks, it's all connected. The, uh, substance abuse problems are poly-substance abuse problems. They're not done in a vacuum. The opiate epidemic in this country today is not a 14-year-old who wakes up and says, I'm going to inject heroin today. I've never done drugs before. It's a 35 to 40 year old white male who's overdosed an average of six times, been in and out of treatment half a dozen times, who doesn't get lucky the next time the overdose happens, and has a 25 to 30 year history of alcohol and other drug abuse. That is the opiate epidemic. And so we can absolutely treat it at the end, and there's a lot we can do for people that are unfortunately have gone down that path, and we need to do a much better job with those folks, no doubt about it. But we also got to think about what can we do to stop this progression. And I'm not here to throw out the gateway theory, which a lot of people have very strong opinions, but there's no opinion that's factual that the vast majority of those dying of our overdoses today have had and tried and used a lot of marijuana and alcohol in their life. And how that contributed is an interesting discussion to talk about, but there's no doubt that it's 98% or so of people abusing heroin absolutely have marijuana early on. Now, by the way, the majority of marijuana users don't go on to heroin either. So again, you can have an argument either way, but if I'm looking at the people who are dying today, I can't divorce marijuana, alcohol, benzodiazepines, all the other substances that are going on with that. And so you can't say, why are you talking about marijuana when you should be talking about alcohol? What's interesting is while every drug is down among seniors, high school seniors, marijuana is the only drug that's slightly up according to monitoring the future. Now among younger kids, 12 to 17, we've actually seen a national reduction in marijuana use, interesting. But folks, don't confuse national data with what's going on in your neighborhood or your state. And this is where the manipulation with the statistics happens by people who it is in their financial interest to say, you know, the old saying problem, what, 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 what problem? We're fine, things are going great. And sadly, a lot of people in government, and these are well-meaning people, they now have to defend what quote unquote the voters have told them to do. So they're in such a defensive posture, and obviously with our political dynamics of today, it doesn't help. They feel attacked. Have you ever heard a politician get up and say, I'm going to have a press conference today to talk about the bad things going on in the state? No. So you're not going to be seeing that press conference anytime soon. And I understand. I've worked with politicians. I get how that works. But that should not cloud what the data is actually saying. Uh, a study that just came out the other day that I have to highlight early is that people with marijuana use were more than twice as likely to go on to abuse opiates uh, uh, and have an opiate use disorder or have an incidence of opiate use. 
And this was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Now, again, the baby boomer generation, a lot of them are going to laugh at this. We never, you know, we have so many uh, successful people that have used marijuana and they're just fine. I know a lot of people and there, and no doubt there are a lot of people who are successful that have used marijuana. Absolutely. Gen some geniuses that have had a great life. Just like there are so many people that drive 20 miles over the speed limit that never get into a car crash. Think of it like a speed limit. Most people who drive over the speed limit are fine. Actually, you know, and I hesitate to say this with young people around, but most people who don't wear a seatbelt are actually fine too. It's amazing. But if you don't wear a seatbelt or you speed on a freeway, you're six to seven times more likely to get into a serious car crash. So there will be people who will be just fine and not have these problems. That does not mean that this behavior doesn't increase the risk of problems. And if you're in the addictive industry, which you're in if you're in the marijuana industry in Colorado, you are banking on the fact that people are using your product a lot. You don't care about, I hate to say it again, the age in this room, it is not about, uh, about all of you. I, I hate to say it, but it just isn't. It's not about all of you, you know, smoking a joint once a month in your basement and whatever and that that's not what the industry cares about the alcohol industry could care less if you have a glass of wine with dinner that doesn't put profits in their pockets what puts profits in their pockets is this table right over here this is where the money is this is where all the money is it's getting young minds hooked on this love affair and by the way if you want to you could justify that in any way by just typing in google is marijuana good or bad or, you know, and the industry loves to pay for the Google results. You know, when you Google something, someone's paying for what you see. And so this is about an addictive industry that gets rich off of a small number of people. They don't need you to be addicted. You're, you know, got to, you're, God bless you. Most of your brains are developed. You've decided what you like. Have you seen a Coke or McDonald's commercial lately focusing on the over 40 set? No. <laughs> Coke and McDonald's, they want to hook these guys. They're, you're, it's past for you. I hate to say it, for them. It's the same thing with marijuana. And so we started SAM, Smart Approaches to Marijuana, to try and push back on this. Republicans and Democrats coming together and saying, at the very least, slow this train down. We've had a disastrous tobacco industry, a disastrous pharmaceutical industry alcohol, why do this again? And we've partnered with, with scientists. What's amazing about scientists, and I have a PhD, so I, I feel like I can say this, um, there's no PR in PhD. Uh, we're not trained to get our science out into you know, language that people can understand. <laughs> we're trained to speak in science speak. And how many Americans do you think read the Journal of the American Medical Association last night before going to bed? <laughs> not that many. But the average person, especially young person, Googles is marijuana addictive, and hey, Kevin, one kid said, Wikipedia told me that it wasn't addictive, so how can that be wrong? People verify that, Kevin. Well, let's see who verifies the marijuana page on Wikipedia. You'd be surprised. It's not the editors of Lancet Psychiatry or the Annals of Internal Medicine. And so the science is not being translated out there, and we're trying to do that by working with scientists around the country. Now, you've heard marijuana's on this march. There's nothing you can do to stop it. It's being legal. Support is at an all-time high. How many of you knew that every state that tried to legalize in 2017 failed? How many of you knew that Vermont vetoed uh, in Vermont? In Vermont, that's Bernie Sanders country, folks. How many of you knew that in Rhode Island, in the, you know, in the north, in a lot of these northeastern states, when it goes through the legislature, you know, I, you have to actually have some reason and arguments and you're accountable to the people in your district. It's a lot harder to pass this. Now, when you have $30 million and a TV ad campaign like you did with Amendment 64 and an opposition that could barely raise a million bucks because we never thought this would actually happen, it's a lot more likely to pass because you can say whatever you want on those 30 second commercials. And they're brilliant commercials. But when you actually have to talk about it for more than 30 seconds, these issues get tricky because we start to ask questions. Where are the pot shops going to be? Are they going to be, are you cool with them being in your neighborhood? Well, no, I don't want them over there. I want them over there. Well, how about you? Are you okay? No. Okay, well, uh, are you good with legalizing marijuana edibles that are attractive to kids? And by the way, I was happy to see that the gummies aren't happening anymore. Yeah, it took you know, two years. 
um, and the industry made a lot of money off of them. They're very happy. They're moving on to their next product line. You know, it's swimming upstream constantly when that happens. But when you start to ask these difficult questions, where are the pot shops going to be? What kind of marijuana are you legalizing? Are you legalizing THC 98% waxes? Or are you le legalizing? I had a woman the other day say, Kevin, this is just about a roach clip. I had to ask her what a roach clip was, because I'm 38. I'm not yet at that. You know, I didn't, nobody under 40 knows what that is. <laughs> and then I said, well, what are you doing about dabbing? She had no idea what I was talking about. So there is a huge cultural disconnect. Uh, again, I, I'm, I feel like I'm, maybe we're, I'm aging all of us here. But again, no one under 30 knows who Cheech and Chong is. This isn't about like a stoner movie, OK? <laughs> This isn't about a stoner movie. I mean, I know they might know Tommy Chong because I think he was on Dancing with the Stars or something. But you know, when I talk to high school kids and talk about Cheech and Chong and think I'm going to get a laugh, boy, am I in for it. <laughs> Please look at the faces of everybody under 20, OK? <laughs> Folks, this isn't about that anymore. It's about an industry with guys that look like me. It's guys that look like this. It's the guys I went to Oxford with. They have billion dollar business plans. I'm speaking to the choir. They have Ivy League degrees. And so. I have a feeling that if voters thought it was about this rather than this false dichotomy that they presented, we'd be in a different environment. They present an idea. They say, Kevin, you can either throw people in prison and have a war on drugs that hurts the weak, or you can legalize marijuana. Which one do you want? Well, there is a big tide against criminalization, against incarceration. That's a winning combination for them. But the reality is, folks, there are so many other things we can do. We're not putting people in prison for marijuana as it is. But there are so many things we can do focusing on prevention, early intervention, awareness. What if we had an ad campaign for marijuana a tenth of the size of the truth campaign for tobacco? Imagine the progress, just a tenth of the size, what that would look like. There are so many things we can do that we're not trying. And instead, we're presented with this false dichotomy. We also are not being told about the advertising and promotion, the coupons, the, the ads, um, the sponsorships, the e-cigarettes that are now the new way. You know, my worry is, folks, marijuana is becoming a gateway to tobacco. It's making smoking cool again. And what's amazing is that with these new e-cigarettes and the new technology, of course, you can hide your marijuana use. No one will know you're using it. No one can smell it. And you might be using tobacco, not THC. And I have a feeling, go forward a little bit, that folks didn't really know what this was either when they're voting for this. Um, if you show somebody in public health this who doesn't have a ton of expertise in marijuana, they will nine times out of 10 tell you that this is heroin. This is black tar. It's this brown sticky substance on the end of a needle. That can't be marijuana. So we have been manipulated by this industry. Uh, we've been manipulated because they want to make it sound like it's about kids with seizures. We need to treat kids with seizures. I'm the first one to say there are many syndromes that need to be treated. We have 140,000 kids do that, that need seizure treatment that do not respond to traditional medications. But folks, we have medications going through the FDA for this. Great. I hope we have more. I want to have as many things that can help people. I have family members that have uh, uh, children with, with these rare neurological disorders. We want to get them any help that, they, that we can get them. But legalizing pot sodas, and with THC sodas, let's be clear, is not the way to do it. And they tug on our compassion um, because we are compassionate people. And what they're really after, folks, is this. This brain that's under 25. The developing brain. Because that is where you're able to shape preferences. That is where you are able to make something lo really liked by somebody. And that's where you hook a lifelong custom, uh, lifetime uh, customer. Look at our legal drugs today. Alcohol, 10% of Americans consume 75% of all alcohol in this country. Who do you think the alcohol industry cares about? The 90%? No. They care about this 10% that consumes. Whenever I see enjoy responsibly on the bottom of an alcohol ad, I laugh because if everybody enjoyed alcohol responsibly, they wouldn't be making any money. They make money from alcoholics. There's no other way to put it. 
And it's the same thing, by the way, as with the opiate epidemic. Most people don't abuse OxyContin, folks. Most people don't abuse Vicodin. It sounds controversial, but it's true. The small number of people who abuse it for whatever reason, you can blame doctors, you can blame prisoners, a lot of things you can, people you can blame. The small number of people who use our prescription opiates are responsible for 90% of the problems and the addiction. And that is exactly the same thing. So why would it be any different? You know, <laughs> we think that with marijuana, like, you know, it, this time it's gonna be different, this time it's gonna be changed. I don't have any evidence to understand why we would think it would be different at all. And so the, the active ingredient in marijuana, THC, ha we've just become much better farmers in this country. We are much better at agriculture than we used to be. It's good news for a lot of it and a lot of different crops, probably bad news for our brains, because we don't know what high THC stuff is doing to our brains. We don't even have that research. There's some research coming out of Colorado I've seen, and Dr. Wang, you have great people on the cusp here. Dr. Chris Thurstone, Ken Finn I talked about earlier, Katie Wells looking at pregnant postmortem women. I mean, the public health community is really trying to stand up. It's difficult in this environment with the industry. But they are not, they're not looking at policy. They're just looking at our bodies and brains and saying, wait a minute, we don't know what this stuff is doing. THC has been so manipulated in the modern plant, we have genetically bred out things that actually don't get you high anymore, like CBD. The CBD oil that everyone talks about, you can't find that in street marijuana or marijuana that's high in THC. Yes, you can go to different shops here and get different strains, and I guess you're going to believe them um, that they would, you know, that, they, that, that they're truthful in their claims. But even if you do, um, we're, if you want to get high, you're not getting high from CBD. You're getting high from today's high THC. You're seeing kid-friendly products, potency, uh, as I said, increasing, um, aggressive marketing, contaminants. They said we were going to be able to regulate it so there wouldn't be contaminants in it. Who do you think is smarter? The state bureaucrats that are playing catch up on the EPA list of non-allowed uh, adulterants and additives and environmental carcinogens, or the industry that has a financial incentive to make the best kind of pot that they can make no matter what they put in it. And again, I'm not, this is, there are people in state government in this state, I know that many of them very well, they're trying to do the right thing. They, they, they didn't make this happen, they're just the people implementing. I get it, it's not a knock on them. But if we think that we're actually gonna be controlling this, oh, and by the way, at least you got, all your, uh, got rid of all your drug dealers in Colorado, right? They're gone, yeah. They all like went to dental school or something. Maybe there's been a big <laughs> enrollment here at CCU, Jeff. Maybe that could be something. We actually think that they're going to start selling ice cream or something. You're able to outsmart, outwit the legal regulated industry. And uh, well, at least you have all this tax revenue, right? School's number one in the country now. P teachers being overpaid. You have so much money you don't know what to do with, right? I mean, at the very least, does everybody who needs mar a THC marijuana treatment in the state get it for free? Why not? You made $300 million, they said. They're touting it. Oh, they are all over the country. They'd love to talk about you. $1.3 in sales, $300 million in tax revenue. Are you able even to take care of your own? How about alcohol treatment? Opiate treatment. You have the second largest opiate uh, addiction in this. Have you been able to pay for treatment for people who have uh, heroin as their primary drug, the fentanyls? W what's happening with alcohol treatment? Are you able to pay for that for people? So this magic idea is nothing more than magic. And it, I am convinced that when people hear the truth and know about it, and when they have to live next to a pot shop and smell that every day when they take their kids to school, it gets old very quickly. I'm telling you, as a visitor, it gets old. Why would I want to stay in the 16th Street Mall anymore? I, I mean, go to visitdenver.com. I mean, they, have, they are admitting, the tourism site is admitting the problems they're having, the convention goers, the feedback they're getting. I'm not sure if the, if the state politicians have found that out yet and took that webpage down yet, but it doesn't do well for reputations. And it's because of this very, very greedy industry you now have the wonderful distinction of being the number one youth use rate in the country. Now, of course, you can hear from folks saying, no, but marijuana use has gone down among kids. Great, well, how many schools did you look at for that? Well, we left out the second and third largest districts. Oh, okay, well, what about the other? Well, we left out the sixth and seventh largest districts too. Oh, okay, so is it representative of the state? No, but it's going down. Well, folks, that doesn't tell us anything. 
What we do hear from, though, is the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, the only representative sample of drug use in the country for Colorado, the state sample. And that state sample puts Colorado at number one. It also, what about the 18 to 25 year olds? So your brain doesn't, 18 isn't the magic number in this game, folks, about 30 years old is, but 18 to 25, what's happening with our young people as they're competing with China and India and all the other countries for 21st century jobs? Are they ready? I hear you having a hard time filling construction jobs in the state because you can't find people to pass a drug test. So I don't see how this helps us. I mean, I, again, this isn't political. I don't see how this helps us make America great again by any means. I don't see how pot has ever done that for anybody. And um, we were fooled once by big tobacco. I don't want to be fooled again. I'm not going to go through all the data, but I do, some things uh, do kind of stick out for me. The fact that mo more Colorado youth on probation are testing positive for marijuana, um, more kids that are in trouble. The fact that marijuana offenses in high schools and elementary have, schools have gone up. Okay, so now you know you have more officers dealing with this at schools. Do you have more student assistant officers at school now with all the tax money that's raining down from the sky? Have you been able to hire more people to enforce the law, at least among young people? I didn't think so, but these offenses are going up. Um, even the New York Times admitted marijuana taxes won't save state budgets. We've seen this play out. You have a lottery here. Do you have a lottery here? Oh, okay. So is that helping your schools be number one in the country at least? I mean, what's happening with that? We are promised these things over and over again. Um, Chris Stifler saying in the Denver Post why pot Texas can't solve Colorado's budget problem. And look at our revenue and costs. Alcohol costs 10 times more than it brings in tobacco even more so. Now you're talking about a drug, marijuana, that combines some of the worst parts of tobacco, inhaling something, and the worst parts of alcohol, intoxication. Tobacco doesn't make you intoxicated, dirty little secret. You can drive a car and smoke a cigarette. You can go to work and smoke a cigarette. Um, but THC actually messes with your mind. And so what are we doing in terms of the cost with that? The emergency room, I'm not, you know, you all know this, but the emergency room admissions that have gone up in this state among very, very young kids, um, the black market that remains in Oregon, 70% or more of the marijuana market in that state is illegal. That's what the leaked police report said, and then the state had to disavow. The state said, no, we don't know anything about that report. We actually had to file a public records request, which we're doing in this state as well because we can't get straight answers from government officials who have to defend their legacy. I hate to say it. Very well-meaning, nice people. But they have to defend a legacy. And it's in their lap and they wanna make the best of it. I get it. But we have to keep them accountable. And that's something that Justin with the uh, Marijuana Accountability Coalition is gonna be doing uh, in the future. And I, I, I hope that you can connect with them. They'll be giving a workshop later on youth um, so in legalized states, we're seeing workplace protections is now a new issue. They want to bring public use. You know this. They want to talk about, I mean, can you believe that we're actually debating public use again of a smoked uh, drug? I thought we'd been there, done that. I thought we learned, but here we go. And then um, the other issue I love uh, just to, it makes me so sad actually, I love, but it's incredible to bring up, is the fact that the juvenile arrest rate before and after legalization, it's higher now than it was before. In fact, more kids of color being arrested. So I don't see how this is helping with social justice, especially when I look at Denver and the census and I see the broad Hispanic population here on the, on the western side of the city, the African-American smaller on the northern part of the city, northeast, and then you see the concentration of where the pot shops are. Of course they're going after the weakest in society. That's what you do when you're a predatory industry. You know, folks, addiction is not only going up here in your brain and your DNA. Addiction is something that is formed by your environment as well. And the industries know that. And so that's why there are eight times as many liquor stores in poorer communities of color in this country than in upper class communities. That's why uh, OxyContin and Purdue Pharma focused on poor rural whites of Kentucky and West Virginia in the late 2000s. They go after the folks who don't have the ready access to health care, housing, education, who don't have daddy to bail them out if something goes wrong, or the best lawyer in the state, who don't have the job waiting for them even if they test positive for a drug, who don't have access to $100,000 a year to go to Malibu and go to drug treatment if something happens to go wrong. 
And so when you're that addictive industry, you are absolutely focused on the weakest in society. They will be some of your best customers. And you start to look at the drug use rates among the vulnerable kids in this state under 25, and you will see the corresponding increases among the most vulnerable kids, among the um, LGBT youth, among young kids of color, and the poorest of any race as well. Um, we need to wake up if we think this is about social justice, folks. This is about making guys that look like me and live where I live. I live in Manhattan, rich. This is about Wall Street and Silicon Valley. This isn't about anything else. And I'm fine with not criminalizing young people. We don't want to criminalize young people or people that have a drug problem. We want to get them help, get them treatment, early intervention, mental health. We haven't even talked about comorbidity, mental health disorder, which we'll talk about later, but I am, that's the stuff that scares me the most, the schizophrenia, psychosis, depression, anxiety. I mean, anxiety for anyone under 30 is already, I can't fathom how much it's off the charts already versus my generation. And now you're going to add this to it. Um, Obviously, the construction issue we talked about, I want to go forward because I, I, I want to have a few uh, minutes for questions. Look, I get that you've legalized in the state. There are some things you can do to make a very bad situation a little bit better. And I know groups have focused on this, edibles and high THC concentrates. Why should the marijuana industry serve on a rulemaking body that determines how marijuana is sold and packaged and marketed? That one I can't figure out. Can you imagine if Philip Morris served on the board of the Tobacco Control Commission? Or if we allowed Purdue Pharma to help write our national prescription drug strategy. It, it makes zero sense that the people who are going to be regulated are the regulators. When I see journalist after journalist in this state, when I see marijuana regulator after marijuana regulator go into the industry, I get it. There's money there. But where are the prohibitions and some rules on that? I mean, we, you know, in the Obama administration, I couldn't talk to anybody for five years that had anything to do with any program that I touched. You know, where are the stricter rules here? I know there are some rules, but not many. Um, advertising and promotion. I, advertising? We don't, we don't have Joe Camel anymore. Adver you know, we don't have the Marlboro Man. I don't understand why, why the, and by the way, you say, well, they're not permitted. Well, why do I see the coupons everywhere? Why do you see signs everywhere? Um, a science-based public awareness campaign like I talked about earlier, and then drugged driving. And if you think you're ever gonna get to a .08 for al like alcohol for marijuana, think again. Metabolizes in the body so much differently. It sticks in your fat, stays longer, affects people differently. But I think that if you're driving impaired, if you fail a behavioral test on the road, and if on an oral swab we can detect that you've used marijuana fairly recently, that should probably be good enough evidence that you shouldn't be on the road. Car crashes have increased in this state. They've doubled in Washington state as well, related to marijuana. At the very least, we need to have put some protections in. Good intentions do not matter. Market dynamics in this issue matter. I don't care if you have the best prevention campaign in the world and you're the industry. It's about market dynamics. And until we realize that, absolutely the pot industry will become another big tobacco. They're already writing the rules of regulation. We can reform our laws. Absolutely kids with seizures should get whatever helps them. Absolutely kids caught with marijuana should not be imprisoned. Absolutely we shouldn't target young people of color. Fix those things. But you don't have to fix them by making the problem worse with rampant commercialization. The industry has its sights set on 2018 in multiple states around the country. We'll be working very hard. Michigan is going to be the next state with a ballot initiative in 2018. We're setting up an apparatus there. I do want to end with a quote by the world's foremost um, scientist on marijuana. Her and I had the privilege of being with Pope Francis recently to talk about this issue, which has been a pretty incredible experience at the Vatican. And one thing that she said at that meeting, which was also published, was an incredible thing, which is basically the effects of a drug, legal or illegal, on health are determined not only by its pharmacologic properties, not only by the way it, it, it affects your brain or body, but also by its availability and social acceptability. She said, in this respect, legal drugs like alcohol and tobacco offer a sobering perspective, accounting for the greatest burden of disease associated with drugs, 
Greatest burden, more than heroin, more than fentanyls, more than uh, Oxycontin, more than meth, more than crack. Let's, that means a lot. The greatest burden, not because they are more dangerous than illegal drugs, not because when you have a beer, that's more dangerous than you know, using fentanyl, but because their legal status allows for more widespread exposure. That's what this is about. And it's about normalization and widespread exposure. That's why these young people to my right are dollar signs to this industry. Because if they can e e expand widespread exposure and normalization, they will get rich. So we obviously have a lot of work to do. I am excited by the various groups and people I see in this room. I absolutely think there is a pushback coming. I think that unfortunately we have to feel it before we sometimes make any, have any action on it. I mean, how long did it take for us to realize smoking in restaurants wasn't a good idea? How long did it take for us to hear that, you know, to realize that Philip Morris selling pot, uh, marijuana, not marijuana, to, although they're going to do that too, by the way, the tobacco industry colluding with marijuana. Don't, don't think that they're, you know, not looking at marijuana. In fact, the biggest marijuana industry group is partnering with the tobacco industry as we speak. So we have that little thing to look forward to. But how long did it take for us to realize that candy cigarettes weren't exactly aimed at adults? It will take some time, but I am confident we're going to realize that. We're going to need voices like yourselves out there. It's so hard not to be discouraged here. It's easy for me in a lot of the states that don't legalize. And they, by the way, they look at Colorado. I have to say one vignette. We were at the UN, okay, with the Netherlands, okay? The Netherlands, what are they known for? Pot, right? 1976, they de facto legalized. We used to look at, and they will tell you, we used to look at the Netherlands in the 2000, when we were, you know, in the 2000s, we would look at the Netherlands like, oh my God, those pothead Dutch people, what are they doing? And whew, do they know what they're doing by legalizing marijuana? They're just, God, what are they thinking? Folks, it's embarrassing to go to international meetings now. They look at us and say, huh, Kevin, let's talk about Colorado. That's all they want to talk about, Colorado. I mean, they, don't, they can't point out Colorado on a map, Doug, but they, can t they know what your reputation is. And they're like, wait a minute, Kevin, you guys were the ones saying we were kind of crazy for allowing coffee shops and allowing people 21 and over with no advertising to use a little marijuana here and there. You now have 99% THC that you're advertising for next to nothing in your newspaper that every kid under 18 is reading. You now have products that resemble candies. You now have all of this kid-friendly exposure. You have lobbyists, Kevin. <laughs> they don't have lobbyists there for the pot industry. They can't believe what we're doing. In fact, do you know that they classify THC above 16% in the same way they classify crack cocaine in the Netherlands? What do you think they think when they see what you guys have to offer in the beautiful menus? It's an amazing change, turning of tables. And I gotta tell you, while we're having that discussion with the Netherlands, China, Japan, and South Korea, and Singapore are cracking up. They're like, please, let us know how it goes. We'll check in with you in 20 years. We'll see how your young people are doing. They're, they're ecstatic. They're trying to hold in their enthusiasm. Folks, we need to wake up. We're in a slumber by the industry that has bullied, pushed us down, kicked us while we're down, saying that we are the dinosaurs from the Stone Age who want to put everybody in prison, that we are outdated. Folks, we have the science on our side. We have the evidence clearly on our side. It will take some time for things to, I'm not saying the sky has fallen now and this is a horrible, it's a beautiful state. It's a beautiful place to be. I'm always in awe when I open those curtains in the hotel room and see those mountains. It's, a, it's amazing. We're not saying the sky has fallen, but we're saying things are not looking too good, and we're really worried about what it's going to look like in 10 more years. Marijuana is a slow kill drug. That's what I talk about with people struggling with this. It's not heroin. It doesn't transform your life tomorrow, usually, although now with 99%, God knows. But generally, this is something that is over time with a kid. This is a 13-year-old who starts to use that, you know, doesn't do as many extracurriculars as they used to. Big deal. Well, when they're 15, you know what? I'm not going to take algebra this year. I'm going to just kind of go to pre-algebra. And when they're 17, you know, what happened to your friends that used to put, oh, well, I actually have to hang out with a different group of friends now. Oh, okay. Well, all of those things individually, yeah, when they're 18, I'm going to apply to the community college. I, I'm actually not going to go for the four year. I, I want to take some more time, figure things out. Individually, those things don't seem like a big deal. They happen. But when you look at the trajectory over time and what, what that's doing, among a vast majority of the population, that's something we need to be worried about. 
But I'm confident that we have the truth, we have the science. At the end of the day, industry will not prevail, I'm certain, even though they have a very strong motivation to do so. But we're gonna need your voices to stand up because none of you were around when we normalized tobacco in the early 1900s. We can't blame you, anybody in this room, for Mar the Marlboro Man or Joe Camel. But in 100 years, when their kids and grandkids are meeting here again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be up to us now on whether or not they're going to say, what were they thinking? Why didn't they do, some, do more? And I know you're already doing a lot, but why didn't they do more? And I hope that, that their grandkids are not going to say that. I don't think they will because I think we can turn this around. So I'm excited about the day. Incredible group of speakers I'm honored to share the stage with and many of you in the audience. And um, just thank you so much for being here and your activism. I know we will overcome this. Thank you. Thank you.